Today we're talking about the top 10 tools that get used for virtually every project in my shop. Stick around. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. I get lots of questions from people about the tools that I use in my videos. What's that little rotary countersink thing? Or where'd you get that magnetic base with the fine adjust? Or is that saw any good? So today we're gonna to go through a top 10 list of my go-to tools that I end up using on just about every project. Now to make the list, a tool has to be something that I keep handy, that I use all the time, and that I would immediately go out and buy again if something happened to it. So with that introduction, let's get started. Starting out the list at number 10 is my 4x6 bandsaw. It just lives back here uh, between a couple of pieces of equipment underneath the drill press table. And I only have to pull it out about this far and I can use it to cut off stock to start a project. So virtually every project starts here. Slide in my material, clamp it down, make my cut, and I've got my rough cuts for my material to go over to the mill or whatever other tool I'm gonna to be using. Now, this is just a Harbor Freight 4x6 bandsaw. You can get basically this model of saw from a lot of different places. Uh, you know, it's an inexpensive import saw. List price at Harbor Freight is something like $270, but never pay a list price at Harbor Freight. They almost always have at least a 20% off coupon active. And oftentimes around Christmas or Thanksgiving, they'll have 25% or sometimes even more. And so you can pick one of these up in any Harbor Freight store, or I assume Princess Auto in Canada or in other places um, for close to $200, which puts this at less than the price of a Portaband. So, and it's because it'll cut off four by six stock, it ends up being a lot more versatile. You can also pop these up into vertical mode. You can take out a couple of screws here and it comes with a table that you can screw on. I don't ever use that. I do use this for rough cutting, especially sheet metal to size because I can just come up here and just make my cuts pushing it through the blade um, without having the table on it at all especially if I'm gonna be taking that sheet metal over and then you know, milling it or machining it in some other process. Now, the one thing that you wanna do with one of these saws immediately when you get it home is throw away the blade that comes with it and buy a good one. The ones that I use, and I'll put a link down in the video description, are the uh, Sterrett Intense Pro Dye blades. And these things are amazing. I try to generally use a variable tooth blade so the uh, tooth pitch actually varies over the course of the blade and that helps to break up resonance and helps it to cut more smoothly. But with one of these stare blades on this thing, it just cuts like butter. It just cuts smoothly through anything I have used it on. Tool steel, aluminum, you have two or three speeds that you can change using the pulleys. I actually have it on the highest speed, which is 200 feet per minute and leave it there pretty much always, unless I'm cutting uh, something like uh, 4140 pre-hard or uh, tool steel. But for aluminum and mild steel, 200 feet per minute, and this thing just cuts smoothly through anything that I've thrown at it. And number nine is Allen wrenches. And when I say Allen wrenches, I mean actual Allen brand Allen wrenches. And these are just, you know, L-shaped hex wrenches. Uh, the Allen brand, this is, a, this is a good quality name brand. I've used a lot of inexpensive tools. Harbor Freight has T-handled uh, hex wrenches as well. And I had those for years. And what I found is the steel is soft and I was constantly rounding them over. These ones have a good quality steel. They've worn very well for me. There's a uh, ball tip on one end. The other end is just straight. So uh, they're marked nice and clearly. This is a metric set. This is an imperial set. Unfortunately, since I work with both, I need both. But uh, these have actually served me very well, um, especially the, the big ones. I get a good bite and they're very comfortable in the hand. And so you've seen these in a lot of my videos. I would totally buy these again. And I use them constantly. 
And the fact that they have these nice little racks allows them to sit out on my bench. I have a place for them in my shop. And so whenever I need one, I can just reach over and grab it. Or if I've got a fastener and I don't know exactly what size it is, I can just take the fastener and just easily fit them on the ends till I find the right wrench, grab it out of the rack. And then when I'm done with it, I have a place I can just set it back in the rack and I know where it is. And so I'm not constantly running around the shop looking for where I put the tool down. Okay, I don't always put it back in the rack, so I do actually spend a lot of time looking around the shop for where I put the tool down. And number eight is Nipex plier wrenches or Knipex, depending on how sophisticated or German you are. If you've never used these, you are really missing out. They're not cheap, but they are very nice and really handy. So this is an adjustable wrench and you can see they adjust over a fairly large range, but it's also a parallel jaw plier so that when you squeeze it, these squeeze down parallel. So for turning nuts, you can use it just like you would an adjustable wrench. The difference is instead of rounding over the nut, when you grab it, you're actually squeezing and putting enough force on it that they just do not slip. And so you can use these as uh, what Adam Booth calls an all 16ths wrench. Use it the same way that you would with a crescent wrench, except it, you're just never gonna round anything over because they grip. And the jaws are smooth, so they don't mar surfaces. So I often find myself using these to turn things that are smooth. I've got this fixture that has these smooth round pins that are uh, screwed in, and I can grab one with this and loosen it and work these in and out, and it gets a good grip on the bare steel without actually marring it and leaving marks on it because they're not serrated, they're smooth. So you can use these for bending sheet metal or any other kind of operation where you need a good solid parallel grip with, uh, without marking the work. I use these all the time for setups on the mill, for the clamping kit, or for like air or plumbing fittings around the house. Very, very useful to have. And number seven is my mini Nogaflex indicator holder. Now this is a small indicator holder that I find actually be really handy for a lot of situations. I do have a larger one. This is not a Noga. This is just an inexpensive import. And there really is a pretty big difference. Um, these, these cheap ones, in my experience, they're pretty squishy. They take uh, quite a lot of force to get them locked down. And once it makes contact, you still have to run the knob down because there's like something inside that's compressing and you just in, it get more and more friction as you go, as opposed to the Noga one, which a quarter turn makes this thing completely floppy. And then a little quarter turn locks it down nice and rigid. And so the adjustment is much more crisp. It's much easier on the, the Noga one to get it into the position that you want and lock it down without a lot of fuss. The other thing about this one is that it has a fine adjustment on the base. You can see there's a couple of uh, ball bearings in here as pivots, and then there's a, an adjustment screw that allows you to adjust it from the base. So instead of being out here on the end of the arm fiddling with it, you can actually just uh, turn the adjustment on the base and adjust the point on your, uh, on your indicator. So this is just a little dial test indicator on the end here. And um, you can see that, I mean, there's very little movement there because this thing is so rigid. And I just gave it a quarter turn to lock it down and then I can adjust it from back here. And so this ends up being really handy and really easy to use. It's not on a flat surface here, and it's not on a metal surface, so it's not locked down. Uh, so it's not sitting level here, but, and then it has their little Popeye magnet, which is a little tiny thing, and you can clamp this, you can stick this onto the side of the quill of the mill. It'll actually sit on the side of the R8 spindle nose, so you can spin it around and use this for centering. Um, I just continue to find all kinds of uses for this thing. Number six on my list is one, two, three blocks. These are really versatile. If you've never worked with one, two, three blocks, it's just a block of uh, hardened and ground steel that is one inch by two inches by three inches. And you can use these for fixturing, like you could set them up on the table of your mill. 
um, like on the sides of the vise. You've seen me do this, then lay a long workpiece across them and then clamp it in the vise jaws to provide lateral support and then vertical support on top of the blocks. You can also set these up, put parts over them and hold them down with toe clamps on the mill. Uh, you can stack these in whatever configuration you need to get the heights. And since they're nice, even increments, if you're working in imperial measures, uh, they're, they're really handy and convenient. You can get any height you want, one inch, three inches, four inches, five inches, um, however you want to use them. They also have tapped holes in them. Most of the holes here are just to make them lighter, but there are tapped holes for 3 8 inch studs. So you can use these with a clamping kit. So you can actually bolt things to them or bolt them to each other. Though the smaller holes won't, the, the non-tapped holes will not clear a 3 8 stud, which you know would be pretty useful. You can also use these as a square. So you'll often see me set one up on the surface plate and then take some part that I need to measure or mark and use it as a square to hold it vertically so that I can then take a measurement off of the top of it or I can set to some dimension and score a line on the side of it. They're also really handy for offsetting parts for measurement when you don't have a surface that will sit down on the surface plate like these TTS tool holders, I need to measure the length of the tool from this register surface. So I can just set this on a couple of one, two, three blocks. This is a very precisely known height. And then I can come in with the height gauge and take a measurement of the length of the tool, subtract the two inches of the height of the block, and I know exactly how long my tool is. They're also really handy for use in a vise for angled setups. So you can take a block, clamp it in your vise at a known angle, either using angle blocks underneath it or a sign plate or a sign bar, or you can use a digital angle gauge to set this angle and then clamp your part to the block, either using the threaded stud holes or just reaching around like with a cant twist clamp to do an angled setup so you can cut, you can make angled cuts in a part without having to tilt the head of your mill. And one of my favorite one, two, three block tricks is to just take a one, two, three block, which we know is already ground flat so that it will run smoothly on a surface plate without rocking and then just stick a magnetic uh, indicator holder to it with a dial test indicator and use it for inspections on the surface plate. Use this exactly as you would a surface gauge, except that you have, uh, in general, you tend to have with these arms a better adjustment experience and more flexibility than you would with the typical arms and snugs on a normal surface gauge. Coming in at number five on the list is my Baldor buffer set up with deburring tools. So I've got a Scotch-Brite wheel on this side, so it's a soft wheel with grit impregnated in it, not a hard grinding wheel. And on this end, I've just got Scotch-Brite pads, uh, so they're a little bit softer and conform a little bit better to the surface of anything that you use these on. Now, I haven't had this very long, but since I've had it, I have used it for everything. I love how fast this thing spins up and how quiet it runs. So anything that comes off the mill that I need to cut or that I need to deburr, I just walk it over here. I think it comes off the saw. My saw is actually down here, just probably just out of the frame. And so after I cut something, I deburr it before I handle it, before I take it over to the mill. Um, and this is just so quick. If I've got an edge that I just cut on the mill and needs to be deburred, I walk over here, it spins up quick. I can take one quick little swipe and it just cleans up that edge without rounding it over. And I, I love that, it's so quick. And so again, I end up using this for just about everything. On the, the buffing side, especially if I'm dealing with stuff that came from the mill that has marks on it and I'm not actually machining the surface. So like here's an aluminum extrusion 
that's got marks on it, it's got some dirt, it's got some little scratches, and I can clean this up very rapidly on the buffing end if I'm not going to be machining that surface. The scotch Bright pads, they just very quickly shine it up, leave a nice smooth brushed finish, take the mill markings off. So I use this for just about everything and having it here so that I can just run over and make a quick deburring pass is, is, is really handy and it speeds up my workflow. Just like that. Coming in at number four is my Wilton vise. This is a Wilton Tradesman vise that I picked up a few months ago. And compared to the Harbor Freight vise that I had before, this thing is amazing. There's basically no movement in the movable jaw. So it doesn't rock, it doesn't rock either way. There's no play in the uh, slide mechanism. So the jaws come together squarely and they come together level every time and it moves smoothly and clamps easily, and this has just been a joy to use. It is strong, I use it with uh, the sheet metal brake bending jaws you've seen in other videos. I did make one modification to it, pretty much nothing in my shop escapes modification, and that is to put in a roller element thrust bearing instead of the thrust washer that was in here. So from the factory, this just had a thrust washer in here, which of course looked just like one of these. It's just a hardened washer that was greased. And the inside surface of the screw here, this shoulder just ran on that greased washer. And I replaced it with this, which is a roller bearing. Uh, I'll put a link to the McMaster car part down in the video description. But the roller bearing is just has two hardened races and a number of roller elements in a little cage. And this just goes in place of the thrust washer that was in there and has the effect then of reducing the rolling friction when you tighten down the vise. Now this made using the, uh, the bending brake jaws much easier because I could get a lot more force with a lot less effort and um, it makes using the vise a lot easier. I can generally just spin the handle down with one finger and it will just snug up nice and tight with very little effort. Let me reassemble this. Now because the thrust washer pack or the thrust bearing pack is thicker than the original thrust washer, I did have to make a spacer. And this is actually just 3D printed um, and it just drops in here to give a little bit of extra space between the uh, frame of the vise and the locking, uh, the little locking plate that holds the handle in. And it's just to give the extra space that's needed because that thrust washer uh, was thinner than the bearing that's in there now. 3D printed part works fine here because there's really very little force on it when you're actually clamping. The clamping is going through the, the thrust pack there and the only thing that the keeper here is used for is to pull the vise jaw out and that force is actually opposite where that uh, 3D printed spacer is. But you could easily, you know, stamp or cut a piece of sheet metal to go in there as well. I could probably just throw in some washers. The end result of having that uh, bearing pack in there is that just one finger will give you a tremendous amount of clamping force. So in general, using this thing, I just kind of go chunk, like that, and that's all I have to do because the force is so much higher. With a normal vise, with a normal thrust washer in there, you've got to you know, give it a pretty good crank or lean on it to get a good clamp. This, just even one or two fingers or just your thumb on top of it or just the inertia of the thing closing is enough to hold the part securely. Now, I was a little bit worried that it would allow it to... Um, to back off easily. So 
there's very little force unlocking the vise because again, you've got very little friction there. It just unlocks very easily. And I was worried that, you know, maybe even just the weight of the handle was gonna cause it to unlock. But in practice, it just hasn't. I haven't had any issues with it. So I love this vise. I would definitely buy it again. And coming in at number three is the digital caliper. Uh, you had to know this was gonna be on the list somewhere. This is a Mitutoyo six inch, and I use these for everything. So if I'm making something on the mill, anything where I'm gonna be taking measurements, I use them on the lathe. Any place where I need to move quickly um, and get quick measurements that don't have to be super precise. If I'm working to within a couple of thousandths of an inch, uh, these are just fine. There's no point in pulling out the micrometers or using these for roughing is pretty handy. These particular ones have an incremental mode so I can set a dimension that I wanna to go to, zero it at that in incremental mode and then I can measure my part and it shows me how much further I have to go and I can work down to my zero and then when I'm done with that, I can put it back into absolute mode and then I have my zero restored. So these ones don't have to be zeroed every time you turn them on. Now, if you didn't know, uh, everybody knows you can take calipers and take a measurement between the jaws, and you also have inside jaws on the top, so you can take measurements inside a part. Um, and you know, this is approximation for diameters because especially for small diameters, the way the edge interacts with the uh, curve on the inside is not always perfect. But so that's outside measurements and inside measurements. And then most people also know about the depth rod on the back. So you can take a depth measurement that tells you how far that rod's extended. So for like a whole depth. But one thing that um, a lot of people are not aware of is that the ends of the jaws are actually ground flat so that you can take a step measurement between this surface and this surface. So if I wanna know how wide that step is, for example, I can just measure it like this. So what I'm doing is, if you look at this on the back, I'm bringing the bar up and touching, and I can measure that step. And because you got a large surface area, it's easy to get it nice and square and get a good clean measurement as opposed to trying to do it with the depth rod and not necessarily having it perfectly square, being able to control it. So that's a handy little trick that a lot of people didn't realize their calipers could do. And coming in at number two is my Noga deburring kit. And this is probably the one thing that I get the most comments about and the most questions about on the channel. So this is a little Noga rotary holder with a number of tools. And the one that most people ask about is this little rotary countersink. So I use it primarily for deburring holes. So if I got a hole here, this one actually is a thread and I can just stick it in there, spin it around and I get a nice clean little tiny chamfer. It takes the burr off of the inside of that hole. Uh, it also has an external deburring tool. So this is just a conical cup with a single deburring edge on it. So you can use this to deburr the outside of a cylindrical part. Just throw it on there, a few swipes, and you've cut a nice neat little chamfer on the outside and taken the burrs off. And this works on the end of, like if you cut off a bolt, give this a spin on the end, or a piece of threaded rod or a threaded part, this puts a nice neat little lead-in chamfer on the end. And then of course you can use ordinary deburring tool blades in it as well. So this is just a normal edge deburring tool and I can just you know grab a, a piece of stock here and I can feel there's a burr on the edge here from the saw cut and just come right down the edge and peel that off and deburr that edge. There's also, you can get uh, very small deburring tools, same concept, but it comes down to a very small point and so this is sometimes handy if you have a little place where you've got really tight quarters and you're trying to deburr something. Or if I wanted to deburr this edge around the outside, I can do it with this little tool where I would not, with the larger tool, actually be able to get the blade onto that little lip. 
also comes with a reverse tool that can go through a hole if I needed to deburr, for example, that hole down there in the bottom and I couldn't get to that edge, I can actually put this through from the back and then I can go around that edge with the tool from the back side. So often if I've got, if I've drilled a hole into something and I can't easily get to the inside of it, this tool is really handy uh, for reaching through. And then of course you can just buy these in bulk because these are the ones that I use the most and these are the ones that wear out the fastest. And I believe this one can probably be honed or sharpened and it's getting to the point where it's in need of that soon. But this whole thing is just a little kit. I just picked it up on Amazon and uh, it's all the deburr deburring tools that I ever use. And so you see this in pretty much every project, pretty much anything that I touch that comes off a cutting tool ends up with one of these used on it. And the number one most used tool in my shop that I use on virtually every project is safety glasses. Now, these are not ordinary safety glasses. These are safety glasses with bifocals in them. And there are all kinds of small things that I need to be able to see or I need to be able to read when I'm in the shop. And my eyes are getting old and they don't read this fine print so well anymore. And so having a pair of safety glasses with bifocals in them is great. And you can get these with different powers. I just picked these up off of Amazon. These are actually DeWalt brand uh, safety glasses. But these have changed my life in the shop. Um, I used to use a jeweler's loop for looking at small things, but every time you wanna look at the end of an end mill to see if you chipped it or check your lathe tool or grab a number out of the machinery's handbook or try to hit a scribe line with a center punch, uh, these are just invaluable. If you've uh, never used them, pick up a pair and see, see what you think, see if you like them. Like I said, they have been just uh, an amazing thing for me in the shop and uh, it means that I don't have to have some other kind of magnification most of the time. Hopefully there was something in there that you found interesting or maybe even a little bit useful. If you did, give the video a thumbs up and leave us a comment. Let us know what your favorite shop tool is that you can't live without. And if you discovered something new today that you now can't live without, there are links to most of the tools that I showed down in the video description. So check that out if you're interested. Thank you for watching.